So I will speak around 40 minutes. Then you can ask questions if you have. <coughs> so first of all, I would like to welcome all of you to Dharamsala and especially to my institute, Library of Tibetan Works and Archives. And uh, as was introduced, uh, it is wonderful that people from different places come together for peace, for environmental protection, and that is the need of the hour. We had experienced the very destructive effect of the pandemic, COVID-19, and we have all realized the sameness that when you suffer from a pandemic like COVID-19, or more than that, if we suffer from environmental destruction, then there is no national boundary, you see? Unfortunately, human beings don't think about this in advance. They're fond of dividing my country, this country, that country, my community, that community, men, women, you know. We are very fond of dividing, not uniting. This actually shows the smallness of our mind. So our mind should be like the sky or the space, which does not divide, which gives space to everybody. Our mind should be like the sun, which is not biased, which gives light to everybody, <laughs> right? So we should, the first thing that I would like to tell you is that we should really learn from nature and learn to live in harmony with nature. With the reason, with the clear understanding that we all want happiness, do not want suffering. Make, make that point very clear. We all want happiness, do not want suffering. Nobody wants suffering. And when it comes to experiencing happiness, we want maximum happiness, everlasting happiness, right? So now the question is, if that is our inner call, how are you going to get that long-lasting happiness? I have asked this question to many people to many places, in many countries. When I ask this question, then people normally point their finger here, saying that the main source of happiness is to come from within. That's right. But this is not how we think in our day-to-day -day life. In our day-to-day -day lives running, we think happiness will come from outside. If I have a fancy car, if I, if I have a nice swimming, swimming pool, <laughs> if I have a multi-story building, if I have a lot of friends, relatives around, I will be happy. I mean, there's no problem. If you have that, that is good. But I'm talking about the reliable, long-lasting happiness. The source of that is not from outside. It has to come from within. Even if you are the richest man in the world, if your way of thinking is wrong, if you are mentally unhappy, you will never be happy. You may have boxes and boxes of dollar, <laughs> banks and banks of dollar indeed, but there is no guarantee that you will be mentally happy. So make that point very clear. Another point that I would like to make is that unless we have loving kindness and compassion, as His Holiness already mentioned to you, we will not be able to solve any problem. Just through technology, just through science, we will not be able to solve our problem. Right now we have reached a state where we have almost reached at the zenith of scientific and technological progress. But what is going on today in the world? There are so many countries now fighting each other. And because of this show of power, by a few countries which have the nuclear power, other smaller countries also thinking 
that I have to have it. Like countries like Japan, because they have seen the destructiveness of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they almost took an oath saying that we'll never build this kind of destructive weapons. But now they are also, they're compelled to build it because of the bullying from the bigger countries. So that is the state. And this nuclear, destructive nuclear weapons are product of human, misguided human thinking. We have guided missiles, but misguided mind. That's the problem. In Buddhism, we say, you don't have to kill people, they will die. <laughs> right? Right? This is, this is a very simple, a very simple, simple reason. Normally we don't pay attention to even these small things. And in my talks, this is, I have been repeatedly telling people, they look, counting from today, in the next 100 years or so, all this now, 8 billion now, just day before or something, they say it's now 8 billion, <laughs> okay? So after 100 years or so, all these 8 billion people on this globe are all dead by natural process. You don't need to kill them. You see, we never think about these things. So the desirable thing is that it doesn't matter how you long live, how long you live, but while you're living, live harmoniously. Enjoy life. Enjoy peace. Enjoy sunshine. Enjoy the forest walk, whatever, you know. Be happy, you can do that. Right? So therefore, the point that I'm making is we need to have this clear understanding that reliable, long-lasting happiness has to come from within. Now this is not only taught in Buddhism, it is now repeatedly proved by science also. When they look for a solution to depression, loneliness and so forth, they, they realize that the mind has to be trained. So gradually they are coming to that point. Because they thought that everything will be solved through the smart pill. <laughs> but these smart pills, these this medicines, they are there to cure your physical illness. Not so much of mental illness. Mental illness must be removed through mind training. So that's why Lama Dorje has asked me to explain this adverses of training the mind. So that's why I'm saying that how important it is to train the mind. For your mental illness, the only solution, the best solution is training of the mind. The training of the mind is not necessarily in accordance with Buddhism. We are Buddhists, so it's of course wonderful. But even otherwise, train the mind means, as I mentioned right in the beginning, to have a clear understanding of the law of nature and live in harmony with that. Right? And use your human brain. Training the mind also means use your human brain. Don't just, you know, stupidly follow everybody. That's also a big problem today. We are living in the age of information. There's so much information. We are overflowed with information. Then people tend to follow every information. Maybe this is right. Maybe this is right. No. You should, you should know what kind of information you should follow and what kind of information you should reject. And for that, you need to use your brain because we have this big head, unlike other animals. Human beings have the biggest head relative to the size of the body. And this big head with big brain is for thinking. And, and, and we are not so good in doing that. So that's why in Buddhism, the first thing that we need in Buddhism is study. Study. That's why the process of Buddhist study is listening, then thinking, then meditation. First you listen to a teacher, read a book. Then don't take it you know, for granted. Then you should think. 
how good this one sounds. Think about it. And then through thinking, you will come to a conclusion, you will be able to develop a conviction, yes, this looks good, based on what is being taught and based on what I personally think. Then once you have developed this conviction, then you need to make it part of your life. That, that's the meaning of meditation. Meditation is not just sitting somewhere closing your eye. <laughs> it's not a feel-good practice. It's not running away day-to-day -day business. But it basically means making your mind habituated with this, those good things that you've learned. Confirm it. Make it part of your life. For example, we talk about compassion. It's easy to study compassion. This is compassion. There are three, four types of compassion. This is the meaning of compassion. Compassion is very, very important. That we can read. But then the big thing is, do I have this compassion? Then you realize, I don't have this compassion. Then you make effort to have it. That is the difficult part. So for that, we need practice. Some people, some people ask the question, why do you have to do this practice regularly? My answer is, why do you have to eat regularly? Yes, for the, for the body, you have to eat regularly. <laughs> so similarly, for the poor mind, the mind is also starving. We have to give food for the mind. So food for the mind is spirituality. Study, teaching. And mind is an amazing thing. If you know how to handle it properly, it's really amazing thing. You know, you can, and Einstein, for example, he said that I'm, use, I'm able to use my brain maybe 7% or something that, not more than that. And he said if I'm able to use the mind a little bit more, I can do all kinds of miracles. That's absolutely true. But now in Buddhism, miracle is not just being able to fly or open a third eye here. But miracle means if you are able to lessen your anger, that is a miracle. Then you will naturally have more smile on your face. Doesn't matter even if you have a broken teeth. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So lessening anger, lessening jealousy, lessening selfishness. When you are able to do this, this is miracle. This is miracle. Once I was uh, working in a Tibet house in New Delhi. There was an Indian gentleman who was working in the American Library of Congress. Because of his job, he wanted to get some information about Buddhism and things like that. So he asked me to, to, to teach. Then I said, okay, come up to the office hour. So we used to sit in the garden. He would ask questions. I explained something. That was many years back. So one day he looked at me and said, since you are a monk, and you also be, be practicing Buddhism, so you must have achieved very high realization. I was dumbfounded with this <laughs> unexpected question, you see. And then I, then I thought, if, if, if when he say, you know, realization, if he means being able to fly, or open a third eye, I don't have any of this. But then I thought, and then said, as he said in Buddhism, Realization means reducing negative emo intensity of negative emotions. So in that sense, I have some at least, not much. Then I told him, when you say realization, it means being able to fly and so forth, I don't have. But I do have realization. You also have to say this. Otherwise people might think he is practicing, practicing, he is practicing, practicing, got nothing. Some people think like that. So it's important, the progress, you need to measure the progress you have achieved also. For example, if you used to be very angry, now that anger is lessened a little bit, that is realization. That's realization. And, and recognize that as extremely, extremely important. And as an example, I, to, I told that Indian gentleman, when I say, I, for example, one of my realization is I don't intentionally kill things, kill people or kill sentient beings, intentionally, right? This may not look so significant, but imagine if we are living in a world where none of these people in the world kills anybody. That is nirvana. That 
it's almost like enlightenment. Mm. So it's not a small thing, it's a really big thing. Mm -hmm. It's a big thing. And imagine nobody steals. You see? So this, these things, on our individual basis, we need to recognize those things. That's, that's very, very important. Otherwise, you're always saying, until I achieve nirvana, until I achieve enlightenment, I'm not going to achieve anything. Then that is very discouraging. Because nirvana is not easy. Enlightenment is not easy. But having said that, when you, for example, have reduced the intensity of negative emotion, like anger, a little bit, you are almost like getting a little bit a glimpse of nirvana. Nirvana is complete state of cessation of anger, jealousy, so forth. You have not reached that state, but you have reduced a little bit. So you are closer to nirvana in that sense. So you need to measure in that way. Because the, the, the process of measuring the inner development is through this way. It is not like, you know, working one month and then at the end of the month you get the cash, you know. <laughs> physical, it's not physical thing. So sometimes people think, oh, I'm not making any development. So don't think that. You are making development, I'm sure. Once there was a Western nun who came to see me some years back. He said, Geshila, I've been living in Dharamsala for many, many years and I'm not making any progress. What should I do? I said, go back to your country. I said, go back to your country. That looked a little bit blunt, right? But anyway, it's not because I said what I said, but she anyway went back. Then after I don't know how, how long, she came back and came to see me. And she said, Geshila, thank you. I said, for what? She said, when I came to see you and I asked this question, you said, go back to your country. I could not understand it. I thought it was a little bit blunt, but now I realize. Then I said, explain. Then she said, when she went back to her country, people are doing so many stupid things. And she was able to see this very clearly. Why this person is doing this? Why this person is doing this? And she, she really realized that how much improvement she has made. That is the thing. That's the thing. That's the difference between getting that exposure to teaching and not getting exposure to teaching or any kind of knowledge. It's a big difference. Okay. So, we don't have much time. So, mind training basically means cultivating bodhicitta. Mind training means training towards development of bodhicitta. You know bodhicitta. All of you know bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, roughly translated, is a wish to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Wish to become Buddha, oneself wishing to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Why one, why one wants to become Buddha? Because that is the highest state of happiness. And we all agreed that I want the greatest happiness. The greatest happiness is there when you become completely enlightened and become Buddha. Now you aspire to get that happiness or the state of enlightenment, not for yourself, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. This is a very important statement. Because if you really want to help all sentient beings, it's not just giving money. Okay? Giving clothes, giving money, things that we ordinarily do. It's good, but that's no, not the solution. You know, we have this English saying, if you, if you want to help somebody, then don't give, give that person fish, but teach him fishing. Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Something like that. So education is a key thing. Education is a key thing. So, and particularly these days, uh, according to some of the recent researchers, they say that today the world is facing mental health crisis, which is true. Right? This is according to research. Mental health crisis, especially among young people. Among young people also, especially between the age 18 to 20. Mental health crisis. Now the important thing here we need to realize is that when you grow up, get the so-called schooling and so-called education, unfortunately, the basic goodness is lost. When, 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 the, when the child is very young, there is a basic purity, basic goodness. 
They don't make any differentiation between this country, that country. So long as you can play together, play together, they're very nice. Fight also, okay, fight a few minutes, then play together. They never maintain ill will, things like that. But when they grow up, then in the school, and society, they see things, then they become more selfish. So that is clearly noticed. So therefore, what we really need in today's education is not just literacy, reading, writing, mathematics, but teaching of the heart. Teaching of the heart. So that is why His Holiness the Dalai Lama is working very hard. And uh, now we, we are promoting this secular ethics all over the world. Curriculums are ready. Many universities have taken, schools have taken that and they're teaching. Because, of course, for the Buddhists, we have very good teaching in Buddhism. But when, when we talk about the whole world, we are talking about those people who believe, who believe in a religion. We are talking about those people who don't believe in religion. We are also talking about those people who are against religion. So even if you are somebody who doesn't believe in religion, it's okay, it's your choice. Even if you are anti-religion, it's your choice. But if you don't have this basic goodness, you cannot survive. So that part we need to teach to everybody. Then if you're Buddhist, then of course you can build on that also. Go deeper on the spiritual you know, path, things like that. So therefore mind training from that perspective is extremely important, extremely important. Now in order to give this training, we need to have a clear cognizance and understanding of the reality of reality of all sentient beings, especially human beings. As I already mentioned, we are all going to die. I'm not making it up. If you go through the pages of pages of all the past history, the greatest and greatest of the kings and the, you know army generals and the you know, the medical doctors or famous religious teachers, nobody has lived forever. They are all gone. This reality. Now why we, do need, why we have to understand this reality? The, the need to understand this reality is if you have a very clear conviction of that reality, then it doesn't make any sense to make any discrimination. It doesn't make any sense to try to kill each other. It doesn't make any sense to bully each other. It doesn't make any sense to create more suffering on other people who are already suffering. No need to kill people who are already dying. Stupid. So I always give, give the example of, for example, a group of people traveling in a boat in a turbulent sea. When the sea becomes turbulent and few, few people are there from different nationalities, when the boat becomes turbulent, they'll forget the nationality. They'll forget, because now they have to face this challenge, this difficulty, and save their life. This is the most important thing. It doesn't matter what passport you carry, <laughs> right? So this is a smaller example. So on a larger scale, we are like those group of people traveling in the same turbulent sea, right? So therefore, with this kind of understanding, we need to train our mind. So as I already said, training the mind basically means cultivating bodhicitta, the, the greatest of all the minds. The wish to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. All sentient beings means including your enemies. For the Tibetans, including the Chinese leaders. You see? And that is not only practice of generosity to be good to others is good for you. It's good for you also. So that's why His Holiness the Dalai Lama always says, if you want to be selfish, be wisely selfish. Our usual way of being selfish is stupid way of being selfish. The stupid way of being selfish is you think just about yourself, forget completely others. All right? So therefore, now let me read the text. May I always cherish all beings with the resolve to accomplish for them the highest good that is more precious than any wish fulfilling jewel. May I always cherish, always cherish. I mean, look at the word. Always, not one day. Not while you, know, you are in the dramsala. <laughs> okay. May I always, 
always cherish, always cherish not only human beings, but all sentient beings. All sentient beings, including the tiniest insects, helpless insects. Right? They all want happiness, do not want suffering. Why the insects are moving, wriggling, changing their sides in search of peace? Right? May I always cherish all beings with the resolve to accomplish for them the highest good. With the resolve means with the determination to help them achieve the highest good. The highest good is enlightenment, Buddhahood, or the highest happiness. So therefore, may I always cherish all beings with the resolve to accomplish for them the highest Mm. There is more precious. Now I may or may not agree with all the translations. Okay, the basic meaning is. Okay, I know her personally. She is a good translator. But sometimes we may or may not agree. But but why I'm saying this is, the highest good that is more precious than any wish fulfilling jewel, means the comparison is, not 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 with the resolve. The comparison, comparison is sentient beings and the wish fulfilling jewel. Wish fulfilling jewel. Okay, regard all these sentient beings more precious than the wish fulfilling jewel. The wish fulfilling jewel, it is said, the wish fulfilling jewel or gem, it is said that that wish fulfilling jewel or gem is very important, very costly. Right? But it does not have any capacity by itself. It does not have capacity to think and plan and help you. But it is said that if you clean the jewel and put on a banner and do some prayer, then your wishes are fulfilled. That, that's, the, that's the story. Okay? So similarly, the rest of the sentient beings, they don't have the knowledge of the path to enlightenment. They want happiness, of course. They don't want suffering. But from their side, they are so overburdened with suffering, with short-sightedness, with negative emotion. They don't have any capacity. It's not that people don't want happiness. Everybody wants happiness. But why we are not achieving that? Because we don't know better than what we are already doing. You see? Right? So therefore, therefore, the sentient, that is the state of sentient beings. But if we help them, if we guide them, if we show them the path, or if we develop love and compassion towards them, then these sentient beings, in relation to these sentient beings, you know, you can get temporary happiness and long-term happiness. For example, I'm talking about practicing generosity, giving. You can't practice generosity, giving a dollar to a rock. Right? It's only in relation to human beings. You're able to practice generosity. You're able to practice patience with other human beings. So all you are able to develop compassion towards other sentient beings. So irrespective of their motivation, you are able to do these wonderful practices in relation to other sentient beings. So therefore they are so important. No need to think that even though I'm benefiting from them, they don't have the motivation to benefit me. That, 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 is, that is not important. For example, you, you regard dollar very important. The dollar has no motivation to benefit you. You regard the scriptures, Buddha image, important. Because you get benefit from it. They don't have the motivation to benefit you. Right? So sentient beings, like, on a, on a temporary basis or long-term basis, they are extremely, extremely kind. I mean, think about the, the breakfast that you get on your table. From, from where all these stuffs come from. Immediately the cook or somebody who is serving you, then from the market, then who made it, who supplied into the market. And especially in today's global world, we are so closely connected to each other that ignoring others is really ignoring yourself. Right? So therefore, developing this wish to benefit all sentient beings is a win-win thing. It's good for you, good for others. Now, when you, when you talk about developing this highest motivation of bodhicitta for, to benefit all sentient beings, you are, you are definitely talking about in association with other people. So you need to be very, the second, the second verse is saying that 
you, you can't just stay alone and say, may I, wish to, may I benefit all sentient beings. That's easy. Right? The problem is, when you mix with them, <laughs> you see? Uh, it's very easy to talk about all sentient beings. The problem is the next door neighbor. <laughs> right? So, so therefore, therefore, think globally, act locally. Think globally, act locally. That's the point. So, so the next verse is saying, we are compelled to live in, live with others, associate with others. So there you need, need to be very careful. You need to be very careful. If you have a big wound over your body, okay, very sensitive big wound over your body, then you join a crowd. You have to be very careful. Make sure that nobody touches your wound, your festering wound, right? Similarly, we have the wound of negative emotions. We're very sensitive. We are not Buddha. We are not enlightened. Our emotions are very volatile, easy to erupt. So with the slight provocation coming from the living environment, you know, you might carry it away. In the morning, you might have been thinking about not to get angry, but here you are when you mix with people. So therefore, it says, whenever I'm in the company of others, may I regard myself as inferior or to all, and from the depths of my heart, cherish others as supreme. So this basically means always practice humility. Don't never become arrogant. In, in, in English, we have a saying, pride goes before a fall. Right? When you are proud, then your pride goes away when you fall. Right? When you don't fall, you always think, I'm somebody. Especially if you have some money, I'm a rich person. If you have some knowledge, I'm very educated. These people know nothing, you know. See, look, they're listening to me. I'm so enlightened. I'm teaching them. See, I'm sitting on a higher platform. You might get arrogant, you see. So that's why in the Buddhist tradition, when a teacher gives a proper teaching, they sit on the throne. Before sitting on the throne, they will do three times prostration. And then they will also snap their finger. So their prostration is to show humility. And then snapping finger means impermanence. Don't get arrogant. You are, you are transient. You are impermanent. So with this kind of motivation, then you teach. Right? So therefore, whenever I'm in the company of others, may I regard myself as inferior to others. You see? For example, this person, maybe her English is maybe not so good as me, but her French may be much better than me. You see? So, so everyone, has, everyone has different talent, different qualities. You see? Right? And then more importantly, as I already mentioned, that these people are really like your teachers in terms of cultivating all your positive qualities. So regard yourself as inferior to all. And not just show, just for show, but from the depth of my heart, cherish others as supreme. Why? Because you are able to become enlightened, become Buddha, because of these sentient beings. You are able to develop love, compassion, patience, and so forth because of the ascendant beings. Right? So therefore, in Buddhism, we use this beautiful phrase, all mother ascendant beings. All mother ascendant beings. Right? Right? All mother ascendant beings. Mensa kungme densai. There is a Tibetan saying, mensa kungme densai. If you observe a lower status, that is actually the step for success, for growth. But right in the beginning, if you become arrogant, you're not going to listen to anybody. You think that I know everything. I'm very special, you see. And look at the, the structure of your physical body. You have only one mouth, two ears. That means listen more to others. <laughs> See more. <laughs> look, at, look at the reality more. Speak a little bit less. <laughs> you see? That's how nature has made us. So from the depth of my heart, Cherish others as supreme. For me, I visited over 30 countries, including Chile, Tinecose, Brazil, Costa Rica, unfortunately not. 
uh, plan plan to go there. I heard about this. I I heard about this. Lot of press about this. The Switzerland. His old his oldness said, you know, Costa Rica is zone of peace. Switzerland is zone of peace. So his oldness hopes Tibet it will be zone of peace in the future. That is his vision. You see. So I, Switzerland, I went many times. So one day I will go to <laughs> Costa Rica. <laughs> anyway, anyway. So, and from the depth of my heart, cherish others as supreme. So what I was saying was, based on my own personal experience, I traveled to over 30 countries. Ordinary people everywhere, they're good heart. They're nice people. The majority, I'm saying. They, 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 are, they are working to get their daily food, look after their family. You know, they are not there to fight with everybody. <laughs> they are not there to make a nuclear bomb, things like that, you see. Right? So they are good. That must be appreciated. This is also important because of the doing of some of the stupid leaders, people might think that the people all over the world is bad. That is not the case. That is not the case. Okay? In all my actions, now, you want to live harmoniously with everybody, respect everybody from the depth of heart, but you fail to do that. You fail to do that, right? You fail to do that because of negative emotions. That's why in the next verse, in all my actions, may I watch my mind. Your job is not to watch other people. Your job is to watch your mind. In all my actions, may I watch my mind and by watching the mind, as soon as disturbing emotions arise, for example, if you notice that you are getting angry, if you notice that you are developing jealousy, if you notice you are developing negative competition, and things like that, and as soon as disturbing emotions arise, may I forcibly stop them at once. Forcibly stop them at once. In, in, in another text called 37 Bodhisattva Practices, Laglen Sudima, Burnjum Cheva Jase Laglen. There is a word which says, Burnjum Cheva, when the, when the negative emotions raise their ugly head, cosh them. <laughs> so that's what he's saying. As soon as disturbing emotions arise, don't say that I'll practice tomorrow. <laughs> no, no, not like that. Not like that. And one of the teachers that says, for example, if you are getting angry, developing some of, the, some of these negative emotions, even if you change the direction of your face, even do it like this, that will help you reduce your negative emotion. So don't just keep on concentrating on that negative emotion. Okay? And as soon as disturbing emotions arise, may I forcibly, forcibly, forcibly stop them at once. You need to use force here. You need to use nuclear bomb. If you can use nuclear bomb, then use that for the negative emotion. You see? And, and you can't do that. So here, your negative emotion that is there within you is the real enemy. Enemy number one. Not the external enemy. The external enemy, however negative, bad they are, they will change. They will die. Right? And somehow if they catch you, you can plead, please save my life, I'll do whatever you say, they might spare your life. But the negative emotions, how are you going to run away from your negative emotions? Negative emotions are within you. Not only within you, the negative emotions have already captured the headquarter of your mind. Imagine if the, if the headquarter or capital of a country is lost, that means that country is lost. So now, right now, in the headquarter of a mind, the the two foremost, two foremost negative emotions, self-cherishing attitude and ignorance. These are the, the king or the prime minister, president, whatever you call it, they're already here. They're already here. They have already captured our mind. So that's why we need to train the mind. Now train the mind means now in the next election, in the next election, you need to dethrone these two and enthrone bodhicitta and wisdom, understanding emptiness. That is the talk, subject matter of this text. 
the most powerful antidote against the self-cherishing attitude is bodhicitta. And the most powerful antidote against ignorance is wisdom, understanding, or realizing emptiness. Now this you remember. You will, you will read so many other mind training texts, but the subject matter of all these mind, mind training texts, the main focus is cultivation of these two bodhicitta. Conventional bodhicitta, ultimate bodhicitta. So conventional bodhicitta means basically bodhicitta, and ultimate bodhicitta means wisdom, realizing emptiness. Why these two are important? Because we, we need to fight against these two negative emotions, self cherishing attitude and ignorance. As soon as disturbing emotions arise, may I forcibly stop them at once, since they will hurt both men. Because if you let this negative emotion stay with you, it will at the end, their job is only to destroy you. Nothing else. They have no other work. In the case of human enemy, they may be bad, but they have there are some purposes also. But the purpose of negative emotions is only to destroy you. Right? Destroy you and destroy others. All the problems that you see in the world today, major, minor problems, are a result of negative emotions, the wrong way of thinking. And if you change that way of thinking, you can become happy. That's possible. I'm not just talking about it. It's possible. And sometimes, you know, just by one word, sometimes just by one sentence, sometimes just by one word, a person's mind can change. I've seen that myself. You need to understand the crux of the matter. Right? So they're, they're not so difficult. You need to understand it. So that's the thing. Now when it comes to stopping these negative emotions, again it's not easy because these negative emotions are strongly entrenched within yourself for many lives. Right? And the environment is also very suitable for developing negative emotion. <laughs> right? Anger, jealousy, hatred. You know, if there is anger, if there is jealousy, if there is sex, then the world looks colorful. That's what we see in, the, in, in any movie. Made in Brazil, made in America, made in India, anywhere. If you see a movie, the main theme is sex and violence. That's the depiction of our life. If these two are there, life is colorful. <laughs> if these two are not there, become a monk. Oh. <laughs> Some people ask me, Geshila, you live alone? Yes, I do. <laughs> are you okay? Are you happy? I said, yes, I'm happy. And then there was one lady I remember. Uh, she actually chased me and said, Geshila, Geshila, are you really happy? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how, how people think, you see. That's how people think. Yes, it is true. With violence and sex, it looks colorful. But it is like, it is like too much ups and downs. That's, that's also what you see in the movie. The ending, you know. <laughs> Lot of problems. Right? But if you are less with violence, less with the sex, it may not be that colorful, but it's stable. You see? There will be less blood pressure. Things like that. So this is, again, I'm not just saying, I'm not saying this is only taught in Buddhism. Scientifically, they are proving it today. Emotional stability, emotional regulation is so, so important. Okay? So therefore, it is not easy to fight against these negative emotions. Number one, the negative emotions are with you. And we have this very stupid way of thinking that anything that is with you should be okay. When somebody gets angry, they'll say, oh, he's a very hot-tempered person, and he's not a good guy. But when you get angry, you say, I have a reason to get angry. Yeah. You see? So, so that way we try to justify our wrongdoings, our negative trends, our negative habits. So we should not do that. We should not support negative emotions. But it's not easy, as he said in the verse 4. But you want to be very good, and then you are in the company of nice people, it looks like you are successful, right? When you are alone, very successful. <laughs> Seems to be very successful because nobody is bothering. 
But when you are with many good people also seems to be successful because they are good. But the test of the pudding is when you test it. So when you mix with the bad people, ang angry people, sad people, then you forget all these practices. You ignore them, you see. It's very, very easy to make friendship with somebody who is mentally stable and who has a lot of money. <laughs> very easy. You also feel like going with them, you know, because you will be entertained, you know. But, but when you mix with a smelly, angry, you know, and a guy, you know, ah, then, then it's difficult. That's what he's saying. When I see, when I see ill-natured people, ill-natured people, with the slightest provocation, they will be angry. For example, for example, if you give them a cup of milk to drink to, to a person with ill nature, and then he takes it. I saw it. You see, he will forget that somebody has given you this milk, but because of the fact that your mouth is burnt, he will throw the cup and break it. Ill-natured people, you see. When I see ill-natured people overwhelmed by wrong deeds and pain, they engage in all kinds of wrong deeds, taking hashish, LSD, you know, <laughs> uh, whatever. I don't know all the bad things. <laughs> you know, they, 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 are, they, are, they are sunk in that quagmire of negative deeds, you see, and pain. And how, how people get into these wrong deeds? Because, I'm telling you, because people just to experience five minutes pleasure, they forget ten years happiness that is to come. Right? We forget the possibilities of ten years happiness for five minutes pleasure. Get drunk or whatever. There's the thing by wrong deeds and pain. May I cherish them as something rare. So therefore, if you really want to train, His Holiness spoke about compassion to you. And His Holiness might have said this to you also. You know, in good times, it's very easy to practice compassion. You sit in your comfortable bed and then say, may all sentient beings, you know, are without suffering. There's definition of compassion. But the problem is when you meet these ill-natured people, angry people who are, who, are, who are yelling, shouting against you, whether you are having done anything wrong. So the real test of practice of love, compassion and patience is when, when you encounter such problems and challenges, in the face of these challenges and difficulties, if you are able to maintain your sanity, maintain your calmness, then your practice is successful. Then you will, you will almost like being able to test the flavor of compassion. And there will be so much satisfaction when you achieve that success in such a difficult situation. And it is possible. We are not just talking about impossible things. It is possible. Let me give you this example of one Tibetan monk who remained in Chinese prison for many, over 17 years. He was a monk from Namjal Monastery. His Holiness the Dalai Lama knew him before he left Tibet. Then somehow he remained behind and he was imprisoned for 17 years. Then after that he was able to come here in Dharamsala. I met him, I helped him go to the hospital, things like that. He's now no more, some years before he passed away. So one day His Holiness asked him to come to see him. So he came to see His Holiness and His Holiness said, since you remained in the prison for many years, you must have faced some you know, difficulties, some problem, some risk. Did you? He said, yes, on few occasions. Then His Holiness thought that that must be the risk of his life. And he asked, was that the risk of your life? He said, no, not the risk of my life the risk of forgetting compassion for the Chinese torturers. For all these years, however, you know, bad things done to him by the, 
the prison guards, he was always practicing compassion. Poor people, ignorant people, they are doing all these bad things to me without any reason. They have to suffer the consequences in the future. He was thinking like this, you see. But sometimes the torture is so intense that he was saying, I face the risk of forgetting compassion. And it is because of this, I've personally met so many Tibetans who remained in Chinese prison for so many years. And when they were, they were interviewed by some of the Western journalists, they, were, they can't believe their eyes. When the Tibetans say, I remained in Chinese prison for 10 years, 20 years, 15 years, things like that, they're not believing by seeing the resilience which is there intact still. That is possible. That's possible. Right? So mind training, as I mentioned, miracle, you see, possible. <laughs> so when I see ill-natured people overwhelmed by wrong deeds and pain, may I cherish them as something rare, something rare. Don't run away from them. See, there's the opportunity. As though I had found a treasure trope. Because the real change will come when you face the challenges. When you don't run away from challenges, when you don't run away from difficulties. That's why Shanti Deva in his Bodhisattva way of life says, suffering is introduction to happiness. The real suffering, it's, it's by facing those difficult challenges that you learn so many things, new things which others could not. You become almost like a trailblazer, you see? Right? So that's important. When someone out of envy does me wrong by insulting me and the like, may I accept defeat and offer the victory to them? Now this is also possible. This is also possible when someone out of envy, there are many people who are jealous, you know. Their envy is a little bit milder word. I might put jealousy. <laughs> but when some, of, some out of jealousy does me wrong by insulting me, there are many people who do like this, you know. Again, this is a very interesting human nature. That, that for example, if I talk about goodness of somebody, oh, he's such a good person, he's compassion, then that other fellow will say, yeah, he may be compassionate, but, you see, he will, he will not join me <laughs> wholeheartedly. He'll say, I know the other side also, you see. So that's, that's wrong. When you talk about good things of others, just say the good things. Maybe there, is, there will be a time when you <laughs> can talk about the bad things also. So, so we have this tendency of uh, being, being jealous. For example, I, if somebody says, Geshele, you are giving such a good teaching, I may feel very happy. Then when I hear the same thing, or oh, some other Geshe is giving very good teaching, I may not feel a little bit happy. Oh, there's another one who is equally good or even better than me. Ah. You see? There's jealousy. Stupid. For example, if your neighbor has bought a beautiful Mercedes car, you get jealous. Just being jealous, Mercedes car will not come to you. <laughs> You're only torturing yourself, right? <laughs> so, so all these negative emotions, all these negative emotions, when you develop these negative emotions, you are the first victim. We need to realize this. For example, when I get angry, then normally we think that I'm getting angry to do something for that other person. Right? For example, if I get angry here with the Chinese leaders, they will have no idea what I'm doing here. They may be enjoying their life, but I'm suffering here because of development of negative emotion by myself. Right? So therefore, when someone out of envy does me wrong by insulting me and the like, may I accept defeat and offer the victory to them. Then you should say, okay, okay, okay. Loss, loss, loss. If there is a place to prove the point, you can prove it. Otherwise, just, just remain silent. Remain silent, right? And also, when, for a good practitioner, when other people highlight your fault, for example, if they say something bad about you, which you have that, bad habit, then that person is a great teacher. Because what does the teacher do? Teacher show you, highlight your fault, and then the teacher tells you 
not to engage in these bad habits. That's exactly what that jealous person or the the person who doesn't like you is doing the same thing. So regard him as a teacher. But if that person is saying something of your fault which you have not done anything, then no need to worry because you've done you've done not done anything. It's it's job of people always saying something, you see. <laughs> it's people's job to say something. If I'm sitting here, people will come and say, Gishila, why are you sitting there? Get up. <laughs> if I get up, then they'll say, Gishila, why are you standing? Sit down. I mean, this is, this is the people's way, you see. So don't, don't worry too much about that. <laughs> don't worry too much about that. The, the important point is, you should not compare yourself to others. Compare yourself, compare today's yourself to yesterday's yourself. Compare yourself, okay, whether you're becoming better or not better, like that, not other people. Even if someone whom I have helped and in whom I have placed my hopes does great wrong by harming me, may I see them as an excellent spiritual friend. Now, this is again another difficult practice. Sometimes we may be helping some other people, have been very kind to that person, but that same person, instead of repaying your kindness, be it your husband, be it your wife, be it your brother, sister, whoever, you know, to whom you have been helping a lot, but this person does something <coughs> which you cannot, cannot even imagine. <coughs> Those things happen. Even if someone whom I have helped <coughs> and in whom I have placed many hopes, right? Parent, parents, they have a lot of hopes to their children. Husband has a hope to the wife. Wife has hope to the husband, things like that. So for a practitioner, the most important thing is first don't have hope from anybody. When you help other people, just help, then forget. <coughs> Son has been giving sunshine, warmth to us for so many countless eons. But did, this, did the sun ex expect anything from us? The four or five elements, they are the source of our nourishment, helping us for so long, but they are not expecting anything from us. So that is the Bodhisattva way of helping other people. Contrarily, if you do something with the, ex with the hope to get something, then that something is not written, <laughs> then you get angry, you see. So that should not be there, okay? <coughs> also, if you do something good to others and then, then you are expecting something, it means you don't really love that person. If you have genuine love, for example, mother's love to their kids, the mother will do everything she can to the kids, but hardly expecting anything in return, because there's better love, right? Better love. There is a story of a teacher who had given so many teachings to many people, and he says that I've given so many teachings to so many people, but I never expected even a thank you, because there is no sentient being who is not suffering. I mean, see. And instead, instead of expecting anything, you should be grateful that I got this opportunity to talk about Dharma, to share Dharma because of the interest of these people. You should not be grateful to me, I should be grateful to you also. Right? Like that. So this is the way of thinking. Even if someone whom I have helped and in whom I have placed my hopes does great wrong, does great wrong, not necessarily that person is enjoying, but because of ignorance. When you're ignorant, not only you will do wrong things to other people, you also commit suicide. <laughs> when you're ignorant, you do many stupid things. So don't get surprised if they do bad things against you. Right? May I see them as an excellent spiritual friend, because it is from these people that you are able to learn. In brief, now he's gradually summarizing. In brief, directly or indirectly, May I, may I give all help and joy to my mothers and may I take all their harm and pain 
secretly upon myself. So in short, in short, the essence of my mind training, the essence of my spiritual practice is to always see how can I directly or indirectly benefit other people and make them happy. Make them happy. And don't, don't, get, don't expect anything in return. Don't try to take the credit, right? They are your, they are your mother. For example, you can, you can easily imagine a mother who has been very, very kind to you. Okay? She looked after you, she brought you up, then she sent you to the school. Now she, you finish your university and all those things. You have a very good job. You are very successful. You have a lot of money. But the mother is now very old. She is unable to take care of herself and things like that. Then at that situation, if the son or the daughter is a good one, then it is the responsibility of the son and the daughter to look after that mother and show more compassion than when she was strong and healthy. When she was strong and healthy, even if you don't help, it's okay. She can take care of herself. Now she is finding difficulty to look after herself. Therefore, it is your job to look after them. So likewise, the rest of sentient beings, however they present themselves to you, in many forms, in good forms or bad forms, but deep down they are all suffering. They all have problems. Problems of ignorance, problems of computation, problems of hallucination, things like that, right? So therefore, your job is to make them happy. And if by doing something, if you are able to bring a smile on the face of one person, you have done a good job. You have done a good job. And my, may I take all their harm and pain secretly upon yourself. Secretly upon yourself means that don't, don't make a big, 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 you know, uh, announcement about it. That I'm doing this, doing that, I'm helping everybody, things like that. And because of this and people, I'm suffering this. You know, don't, don't say that. Just, just secretly. Don't make a big issue out of it. It is something that you are, you, it's your job actually. If you are a practitioner of the path of the bodhicitta, it is your job. For example, you feed yourself all the time. You give yourself breakfast, lunch, dinner, wash your clothes. For how many, how many years you have been doing this for yourself? Have you expected thank you from anybody? I've been looking after myself for so many years. I've been feeding myself. <laughs> huh? There should be at least one person to say thank you. You, you don't expect that. Right? Because this is something, this is something that, that needs to be done and you are doing it. There is something that needs to be done, you are doing it, that is enough. So similarly, helping other sentient beings is also like you are taking your own food or looking after yourself. Don't expect thank you. Okay? Finally, the final words. May none of this ever be sullied by thoughts of at worldly concerns. May I see all things as illusions and without attachment gain freedom from bondage. So that means when you so this first seven verses talk about the bodhicitta, conventional bodhicitta. The last one is talking about ultimate bodhicitta, the, the wisdom realizing emptiness. Now wisdom realizing emptiness means whenever you engage in this conventional practices of cultivation of bodhicitta, make sure that they are not solid, means they are not contaminated by Worldly concerns, at worldly concerns, at worldly concerns. At worldly concerns means for your name, for your fame, things like that. Let me read something very interesting from somewhere. For example, in, 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 in today's language, in Buddhism we sometimes hear reference to the at worldly concerns, which from the basis on which we mostly live our lives. Okay, this eight comprise four pairs of polar opposites. Our actions are motivated by the wish for pleasure, wish for gain, wish for praise and fame, and the avoidance of suffering, loss, criticism, and disrepute. These are eight worldly concerns. The eight comprise four pairs of solar polar opposites. Our actions are motivated by the wish for pleasure, for gain, for
for praise and fame and avoidance of suffering, loss, criticism and disrepute. Disrepute. Especially in today's language. We live in a culture where people seem prepared to go to ever more desperate lengths to achieve their 15 minutes of fame. A flick through the staple fodder of TV game shows and competitors where contestants are rewarded for being bitchy or boorish or otherwise humiliating themselves suggests there are no depths to which some people will not sink just, just to get some kind of fame. People will not sink just to get on TV. Why do so many of us feel the need to sign up hundreds of friends on social networking sites when we really have no idea who they are? Why do we feel such a strong need to be known and recognized? This is because of this strong self-cherishing attitude. I, me, mine. This is not only very strongly highlighted in the Buddhist teaching, but according to the scientific findings also they say that people who make a lot of references and talk about I, me and mine, they are prone to all kinds of illnesses including heart attack. Heart attack. Why? Because when you talk only about I, me and mine, your focus becomes very narrow. You develop tunnel vision. And within that small focus, even a small difficulty, problem, seems to be unsurmountable. But if you think bigger, you may have problem. I'm not saying you don't have problem. You may have a problem, but compared to many other people, this is insignificant. You see? So then you are able to, oh, it's not only me. There are so many other people suffering. You see? So you will never get bogged down with your personal tragedy alone. So therefore, it is so important to develop this wider perspective and holistic attitude. But if we are truthful, most of us are unnervingly similar in the way that we worry about other people think of us. The reason, main reason is what other people will think about us. If I wear this cloth, what he will think, what he will think. You are a puppet. You are becoming, you are making yourself a puppet, you know. Yes. In the case of the puppet show, you know, there is somebody pulling the strings, you see. Yes. Then accordingly you dance. Uh -huh. So the Buddhist teaching is saying, don't become a puppet. You choose your life. Don't, don't pay too much attention what other people think, you know. Right? Your life is your life. It, is, it belongs to you, not to other people. Right? So that's important. We long to be accepted. You see, the great teachers like Milareva, they, they don't worry about what other people think. They do their business. They do their job. You see? And even, even great thinkers like Einstein also, they don't worry about what the other people think. You know? One day he was to give a famous talk and uh, he was not coming. The time was already up. Then his wife goes to see Einstein. He was still working with his dirty pajama. <laughs> then he said, Einstein, you need to go quickly to give the talk. Change your pajama. Then Einstein said, I suppose they come to listen to my talk, not to see my pajama. <laughs> <laughs> you see? You see? <laughs> you see? So if you have this internal integrity, you know, you're not worried about the look. When you are hollow inside, then you're worried about the external appearances. You see? Right? So we long to be accepted, to be thought of as successful, likable, smart, as go-getters, high flyers, out of the box thinkers, the so-called out of the box thinkers, you know, people are people are always talking. Think out of the box. But actually think inside the box. 
not outside, they're inside the box. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps as modest or unassuming or whatever trip we happen to be on, we suffer from status anxiety. Whether we call it the desire for praise and fame or status anxiety, it is a dynamic we encounter everywhere. And of course, the way we project ourselves through the clothes, jewelry, sunglasses, and shoes that we wear, the hairstyle we adopt, and the makeup and surgical enhancements we choose chooses is very often dominated by the wish for others to think of us in a particular way. You see, so it's all external. Hardly anybody thinks what I really think, you know. You're only worried about the external looks, appearances, what you do. So in terms of Buddhist practice also, that's why in Buddhist practice also, we need to practice physically, verbally, mentally. But you'll find people always go for this first two practices. Physical practice, which is doing some prostration, going around the temple, then verbal practice, chanting, doing some prayer. Mm -hmm. Mental practice, not many people. Meditation, not many people. Mindfulness, not many people. Because you want to do something which other people see. You see? That's the human way. You see? But we need to realize that Buddhism is not a show business. It's not for show. It's for your transformation. Okay? <laughs> Therefore, Shanti Deva makes exactly this point. Under, underlining how praise and approval fuel our experience of samsara then going on. In typically counterintuitive style to explain why we should be thankful to those who criticize us. And he says, praise and so forth distract me and also undermine my disillusion with cycle existence. I start to envy those who have good qualities and all the very best is destroyed. So with this concern for the worldly concerns, you destroy everything that is good in you. So when you do, do your practice, do it sincerely, not, not do it for fame, name, you know, whether people are criticizing you or not criticizing it, just do the job. With understanding that may I see all things as illusions, that's the point. Whether somebody praises, if somebody praises you, don't get too excited because there are others who are saying bad things about you. If some people are saying bad things about you, don't get too dejected because there are people who are saying good things about you. And especially if you see everything from the parlance of the ultimate reality, the shunyata, there's nothing to gain, nothing to lose. Nothing to gain, nothing to lose. We don't understand this, right? Nothing to gain, nothing to lose. Everything is like an illusion. To an unexamining mind, I'm right now here talking, right? But you examine carefully this so-called Geshe Lakdor, where is he? What you see is his body, not him. Right? And his mind is also not him. So where is Geshe Lakdor? Just a designation. I call this microphone, right? So. So if I say I'm now speaking through the microphone, you will understand it. Now if I say, now I'm going to speak through the elephant, <laughs> you'll all be shocked and then think, oh, Geshe must be now, his mind has gone out, you know, something like that. But look at this. Why can I call this microphone not elephant? Just designation. We put a name and we agree it. That's all, nothing more than that. There's nothing called microphone existing from its own side without depending on anything. So similarly, in the world of external and, uh, uh, sorry, the permanent and impermanent phenomena, there is nothing that has inherent existence. Everything comes by coming many things together, then we give a designation. So once you realize this, why you get so obsessive with this thing called person? But that does not mean to say that you are not there. You are there based on the designation. The mere I. And that designation functions. Right? 
So apart from this, this capacity to function based on designation, if you try to pinpoint and search and find that person, you will not find it. This is a very important, you know, finding in the Buddhist teaching, Buddha, Buddha's teaching. Not only that, many scientists and scientists and philosophers in the West, they also ask this question about who is this thing called I. Exactly like what the Buddhist masters have found, the scientists and the Western philosophers also could not find the I, which is existing from its own side. So they call it slippery notion. I is a slippery thing. You, you can never catch it. You see? So it's like an illusion, like a dream. When you're dreaming, you know, it, it, it doesn't have the re real existence as, as we have when we're awake. But that doesn't mean that the dream cannot affect you. You might get a nightmare and you get very frightened, very sad, and you get another dream where you win one you know, billion dollar lottery, <laughs> you feel very happy. But when you wake up, nothing. <laughs> so right now the pains and the pleasures that we are experiencing is, seems to be true because we are not awake. Mm -hmm. That's my point. Mm -hmm. So when you wake up, then there's nothing to lose, nothing to gain. So therefore, why worry about praise and, you know, defamation and things like that? All right. Thank you. Coverless. I think we already passed one hour. <laughs> so one or two questions. Just one or two questions. Hello. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when you talk about disturbing emotions arising yeah. and you want to smash them, yeah. what's a good technique? You talked, about, you talked about turning your head. I thought that was really good. You know, turn your head to just kind of change it. Is there any other good thing that you've learned that can help in that moment? So I would strongly suggest that you read Shantideva's Bodhisattva Way of Life. Because if you read this text, Shanti Deva clearly says that negative emotions are very opportunistic and they are very cunning. They will come in many forms. For example, if you are becoming a victim, then anger will come to support you. Don't get discouraged. I'm here. You see? Right? And if you are in need of something, attachment will come. So they all seem to be helping you, supporting you, right? So that is why the scientists, they don't talk about bad emotion and good emotion. They always say emotions are emotions, all emotions are necessary. Right? So this is another point you need to think. But in Buddhism we say the negative, we, we, we make a distinction between positive emotions and negative emotions. Negative emotions must be weakened, they must be eliminated. By all means, sometimes in this text it talk, talks about quashing it forcibly, but sometimes, as I said, you know, just as when we fight the enemy, external enemy, we have to adopt many ways, sometimes running, sometimes a little bit avoiding, you see. For example, if you're constantly getting angry with somebody, then sometimes just avoiding that person will help, you know. So different techniques different techniques. But the most important thing is relate it to your own personal experience and see whether anger is making you happy or miserable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Not just read the text. Okay. Yeah. And based on our own experience, there's nobody who, who will say that today I was angry so I really enjoyed the day. There's nobody. Right? Similarly, there's nobody who right in the morning makes a motivation saying that today I will get angry. Right? So recall those experiences, those moments when you got angry and the mess that you created. Recall that. That's an open book of your life's experience. Learn from that. Then see whether these negative emotions are really useful or not useful. Right? Shanti Deva's Bodhisattva way of life. Yeah, you can you can buy it from our bookshop here. Yeah, it's available here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, could I add just a little 
addition to that question? Yeah. Because sometimes it feels like the negative emotions can be so sneaky and that even within my practice, the aggression can come forth towards... Because the, all the metaphors of fighting against the negative emotions, it feels like they can be imbued with aggression that sometimes can feel skillful and sometimes it can feel unhelpful. Generally speaking, they are, at the end of the day, not helpful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it looks like they are helpful. For example, if somebody has been bullying you for a long time, right? And on all those occasions when you are not able to say anything, do anything, you are timid, you don't have the courage, then suddenly on another day you got angry and you are able to say something, do something, then you think the anger is good, it, it helped you. But, yes, it is true that when you get angry, you got some energy, but that energy is essentially blind energy. Mm -hmm. So it is not sure whether it will hit the target or not hit the target. Okay. okay. Thank you. So the important point that I really want to make you understand is, if you study carefully these negative emotions, they have no solid foundation, number one. They are not supported by any reason. Then these negative emotions are normally narrow-minded. They are narrow-minded. For example, when I get angry, I will never say, people might say I'm, get, I'm angry with the whole world, but they're just saying it, but nobody, can re nobody will really get angry with the whole world. When you, read, when you get angry, you are really getting angry to somebody. She is the one. He is the one. So your become, mind becomes narrow and you want a target to hit. And then you, when you, when you say, ordinarily, when you, between boy and girl, when you have love, then I love her so much. I love only her. Seems to be a big declaration. But the stupid thing they're saying is, only this lady. In Buddhism, we are talking about loving everybody, not just one person. You see? So, so therefore, this narrow-minded, so these negative emotions are really, they are suffocating. They are suffocating. They are narrow-minded. They are short-sighted. Whereas the positive emotions, by nature, they have a solid foundation. They are open-minded. They are comprehensive. They are unifying. And they can bring harmony in everything. Because they are, at the end of the day, in, 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 in harmony with the law of nature. Okay. Um, I've been studying the Lojong training book by Charlie Grimpoche, and there's this one aphorism that I've been thinking about for, like, I think about it all the time, and I'm wondering if it relates to, the aphorism is, regard all phenomena as dreamlike, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if that's related to, may I see all things as yeah, illusions. Yeah, 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 true. So, the Illusion question... Illusion or dream, yeah. I guess I don't understand, like, to regard everything as dreamlike, does that mean to not take things seriously? Or that it's, no, I guess no. I don't understand I, that. I already gave you the example. Okay. In your dream, if you, if you get the dream of winning one billion dollar, you're very happy when you're dreaming. But when you wake up, you don't have even single dollar. <laughs> right? But you don't feel sad. Because you know that was just a dream, right? So that kind of stance should be there in our life also. For example, if you lose somebody, it's like a dream, you see? When you get very famous, also like a dream. So with that kind of understanding, you, you, you don't get carried away. You don't get stuck with anything. Otherwise, you get a little bit of fame, you get popped up. I'm somebody special. You see, you get stuck, you get obsessed with things. Okay, yeah. Um, so I have a question about uh, negative emotions and you were talking about crushing those negative emotions. Um, and there's the negative emotion if you get cut off in traffic. Mm 
yeah. you know? Uh, and it's a very easy negative emotion to overcome because there's yeah. nothing personal <laughs> to that negative emotion, you know? Yeah. It's a moment in time. And then there are negative emotions that can end up causing looping in, yeah. our, in our mind, you know? Yeah. A negative emotion that's tied to a cognitive trauma or a karmic imprint yeah. or somebody doing something personal to you, yeah. um, a death. A negative emotion that you feel keeps on reoccurring and by crushing those negative emotions are you putting bandages on those negative emotions by using mantras or distractions or the different tools that we have to use and is there is there a path to go to root cause to eliminate that by identifying what it is within that is causing that looping yes and can you speak yes. to that a little bit yes yes so so therefore that's why we say the last, the last verse is really talking about removing ignorance. All negative emotions, they have their root in ignorance. Now, ignorance means misconception of reality. Misconception of reality. Reality may be something else, but you have misconceived the reality. For, and because of this misconception, you, you, you will get fear. A lot of fear, a lot of suffering. For example... The clearest example is, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> in ancient India, there was a teacher who, by the, by the side of the river bank, he gave some teaching. And then at the end of the teaching, he calls one of the students and he says, take this book and put it on the table where I sleep. Then he says, yes, sir. He takes the book, he takes the book, and uh, comes back, frightened, by saying, sir, I cannot go there, because there is a snake lying at the foot of your table. Then the teacher says, okay, no problem, I'll give you some mantra, as you are saying, mantra. Chant this mantra, and then the snake will run away. Okay, then he went there with the book, chanting the mantra on Mani Pe or whatever, still he sees the snake. And he says, sir, your mantra didn't work. <laughs> the snake is still there. He said, then take this lamp, light. Then he took the lamp, and as soon as he, he reached closer to the, the so-called snake, there was no snake. It was a coil of rope, you see, because of you know, differences in light and things like that. He could not see things properly. And because of the shape and the style, he thought there is a snake. There's no snake, but he was really frightened as if there is a real snake. So in, in our life, many of the problems, sufferings, they are really result of misconception of reality. And we can get equal fear as if it is real. There's the thing. Now, for example, you, you give the example of you know, getting stuck in the traffic. Answer to that is here. Grant me the serenity. This is not from Buddhism. This is prayer by Epictetus, a Greek philosopher. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. What you can change, what you cannot change. This is from Greek. Similar thing found in verse 10, chapter 6 of Shantideva's book, which I mentioned. Why be unhappy about something if it can be remedied or changed? And what is the use of being unhappy about something if it cannot be remedied or changed? Right? Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. <laughs> right? So these are like beautiful, beautiful things. Beautiful things. There are many quotations like that. So, so therefore, the important thing is you need to see whether these negative emotions are really useful or not useful. And once you see them as not useful, in fact, destructive, you need to see that. Then you will develop this wish to distance yourself from the negative emotions or discourage it. Like for example, why we, why we take medicine and don't take poison? Because you know 
poison is destructive. So like that, we need to know each of these negative emotions, how destructive they are. Then we'll be able to distance it. Of course, not easy. It takes time. But possible, yes. Yeah. So that's, that's good news. Possible, yeah. Okay.